Family Theater presents Maureen O'Sullivan and Otto Kruger. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Otto Kruger in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. To introduce the drama, your hostess, Maureen O'Sullivan. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we're to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. Years before their appearance, Jules Verne foretold the submarine, the navigable balloon, the aeroplane, the telephone, the long-range projectile, and many other inventions. But perhaps his greatest writing achievement was the complex character of Captain Nemo, tragic star of 20,000 leagues under the sea. In this man, we glimpse Homer's Ulysses, Shakespeare's Hamlet, and ourselves, our dreams, our disillusionments, our instinctive yearning for good, These are the things that make Captain Nemo and his great adventure timeless. And so it is with pride and pleasure that Family Theatre presents Otto Kruger in Jules Verne's beloved classic, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. The earth does not need new continents. It needs new men. My name is Pierre Arnaud. I am assistant professor in the Museum of Natural History in Paris. And the year is 1866. Delving into the unknown as I do... There is little surprise with me, and yet today, in this modern life, unbelievable newspaper headlines shock the world. X-ray, X-ray, steamer attacked by sea serpent. We know all about it. X-ray. Another ship attack. Navy to hunt sea monster. X-ray, X-ray, expedition formation. I, I was in my New York apartment at the conclusion of my most recent scientific tour and had planned to return to Paris with my valuable collection of specimens when... Uh, Professor Aronach. Uh, yes, Consul, what is it? Commander Farragut of the United States Navy to see you, sir. Commander Fer. Well, show him in, lad. Show him in. Yes, sir, immediately. Farragut, Farragut coming to see me. What on earth for? Unless it's about the... Uh, sir, I don't know. This is indeed a great oh, pleasure. Believe me, Commander Farragut, the feeling is mutual. In fact, I am somewhat overcome uh, to have a man of your reputation seek out an obscure professor. Quite the contrary, sir. Your knowledge and research of undersea life is highly respected. My government would like to see France represented in the expedition in pursuit of the sea monster. Oh, merci. I'm holding a cabin at your disposal on the President Lincoln, sir. We leave Brooklyn Pier in three hours. Pursuit of the sea monster? What an opportunity. Well, to catch the sea monster, just just think what an addition he would be to my collection. <laughs> a fine ship, Commander. Yes, sir. She's a frigate of great speed. We're well armed, too. Professor, we have everything, from the hand harpoon to the barbed barrels to the blunderbuss and an explosive shells and the big jack gun. I didn't. Didn't I see a breech-loading cannon atop your forecastle? You did, sir. But my best weapon of all, Professor, is Ned Land. Eh? Oh, Ned. Come over here, if you please. Aye, aye, sir. Aye, aye, Commander Farragut. At your service, sir. Professor, I don't know. Ned is known all over the seven seas as the Prince of Harpooners. 
ship, and when we pack down the sea monster, he'll show you some real action. Well, it should prove a real test to your talents, Mr. Lamb. It's a fabulous beast, indeed, that can stove in the side of a ship. You're speaking of the Scotia, I take it, sir? Yes. Well, begging your pardon, Professor, but I don't hold much with this sea monster story. Oh, he's a big one, no doubt, but I've never yet seen any fish of the sea that could bash in a ship's plates. Well, something did it. The Scotia had a gaping hole in our side to prove it. Aye, sir. Something did it right enough. That's why I signed on the President Lincoln, Professor Arano. If there should be a sea monster that big and <laughs> that mighty, then Ned Land wants to be the man to harpoon it. That's the way our voyage began. A strong ship, hand-picked men, and a vast curiosity and determination to end this terror of the seas. And weeks passed... But the long days and nights of tension were beginning to tell. And then, just as it seemed human endurance could stand no more... Ahoy there! The very thing we're looking for! The weather beam! The sea monster! It is less than two cable lengths away now. My harpoon! Let me get to my post, man! Good. Good heavens, your monster is staring straight for us. Up with the helm. Reverse the engine. Reverse the engine. We are moving away from the thing now. But look, look. The monster's catching up with us again. I can't harpoon it, sir. The monster's running circles around us. We can't get near enough for me to use my harpoon. Right the helm. Ahead as you are. No, 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 no. It's no use, Commander. The monster is going to strike as fast as he's going twice as fast as we are. I know it, sir. There's only one thing we can do. Stand and fight. Up the fog, I'll cannon, man. <laughs> The forecastle gun was loaded and slowed into position. The Lincoln was running at half speed now, and the sea monster seemed content to follow at a certain distance, as though it were mocking us. And the gunner, steady of eye, grave of face, took long and careful aim, and then... Fire! Hey! What? Why, the shot bounced off him like a rubber ball. Oh, watch out, sir! The monster's closing in on us. That shot made him mad. He's going to get us this time, sure. Help! Help! You're all right now, Professor. I don't know. So I must say I pulled you out of the sea just in time. Oh, but but where where are we? Aboard the sea monster, sir. What? Aye. No wonder the Lincoln shell bounced off the thing. It's made of sheet iron. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. There was nowhere else to go, sir. The frigate's radar was smashed in the attack. She drifted out of sight. But what what if this monster sinks? Then we'll all be at sea again, sir. Look, sir. Men coming out of the monster. They're coming towards us. They're going to attack. I'll protect you, sir. I'll... Oh. I trust that the state of your health is improving, Professor Arena. Eh? Well... Where am I? Uh, Aboard my submarine, the Nautilus. Submarine? Uh, who are you? You may address me as Captain Nemo, Mr. Land. Captain? Submarine? Uh, then you were... Uh... I am your sea monster, O oh, Prince of Harpoonies. Why, you... Ned, let us learn more about our uh, predicament from Captain Nemo. You are prisoners of war. By rights, I should place you back on deck and submerge, forgetting your existence. You, you wouldn't dare. That, that wouldn't be civilized. I'm not what you so glibly call a civilized man, Professor Arena. For reasons of my own, I have broken all ties that bound me to humankind, and I'm not subject to its laws. Civilized. But then, then what is to be our fate, Captain Nemo? Well, uh, I have been considering it at great length, Professor. I am not altogether heartless. I do have a certain sense of pity for any living thing. Therefore, since fate cast you aboard my ship, you may remain here. 
But of course, you must live under my law. Give your word to cause no trouble or try to escape. Stay with you? For how long? For the rest of your life, Mr. Land. Do you, do you know what you ask, Captain? We are never to see our country again? Our friends? Our families? Professor, you still seem to forget that I could plunge you into the depths of the sea at a word. You have discovered the secret of my whole existence. Do you think I would free you to tell everything you have seen and heard? No, Professor Arena. By retaining you, it is not you I guard, but myself. Well, you are, you are simply offering us a chance between life and death. Just that. But without freedom. There is always a price, sir. Be glad that yours is no higher. Well, Ned and Conceal were taken to their permanent quarters, where I was escorted to a luxurious suite adjoining the quarters of Captain Nemo himself. And the next day, as I stared about me in amazement, I heard the strains of a pipe organ in the next room. And venturing in, I found myself in a magnificent drawing room and the captain at the keyboard of the organ. Good morning, Professor Arena. You seem somewhat surprised to learn that I practice the arts as well as the sciences. But I, I must confess, Captain Nemo, I scarcely expected to find a, you are a musician of inspired music. Inspired? Well, I, uh, no, what, 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 what I meant... I understand I meant, well it, enough it, uh, what you meant, Professor. And I admire your honesty under the circumstances. <laughs> you know, I, I like you, Professor Arena. I like courage in a quiet man. Native pride. <laughs> you have no answer for this turn of events? I, I must admit, I, I do not know what to say. Then say nothing, but watch instead. I have another wonder to show you. I go over here to press a lever. Great heaven, the old side of the submarine is sliding back. We are doomed. <laughs> do not fear, sir. We are protected from the sea by several layers of heavy glass. Behold the army of the sea, Professor. The fish seem to float in liquid light, do they not? Unbelievable. Yes, but true. The banded mullet, the Japanese scumbrous, the beautiful mackerel. All these are my pleasure and my game, sir. I hunt them in an element inaccessible to any other man. You? You hunt? Underwater? Yes, I delight in quarrying the game that lurks in my submarine forests. I am immensely wealthy, Professor. I am owner of a property beyond the power of computation. I cultivate it myself. But it is always sown by the hand of him who created all living things. Him? Then, then, then you... Believe in God? Look out there, my dear professor. In the face of such wonders, how could I possibly not believe in such a deity? But I do not understand. You gave up the world... Merely because I forsook man does not mean I forsook God. But with your philosophy, how, how can you forget man? Why? Why? It is mankind which is forgotten, not I. They have forgotten a God by making unjust laws, tearing one another to pieces, destroying. That is why I seek freedom in the depths of the ocean. Here the reign of man ceases. His power, his influence drowns in leagues of living water. Here alone is independence, peace. Professor, you and your friend shall accompany me on my next hunting expedition. Meantime, feel free to use whatever facilities you desire aboard the Nautilus. I was soon lost in the wonders of Captain Nemo's amazing undersea collection, his library, and of course the wonder of the submarine itself. And then, one morning, we were summoned to a small cell just off the machinery room where we found Captain Nemo awaiting us. If you will kindly don these India rubber diving suits and weighted boots, we'll soon be off on the hunt. Hunt? In diving suits? Unless you prefer to walk on the bottom of the sea without one, Mr. Land. Bottom of the sea? We're hunting there? Exactly. And Captain Nemo has promised undreamed wonders, Ned. I can believe that, sir. <laughs> 
We have now arrived at the forests of the lost island of Crespa, gentlemen. You have your suits on. Now, please put the helmets in place. Well, what are we going to hunt with? Electrical glass bullets, Mr. Land. What? Fired by air guns. And for light, each one of you has two room cork burners. One light fastened on the back, one to the waist. Uh, this is all too much for me. Well, I for one am convinced, Ned. I'll follow Captain Nemo wherever he wishes, even to the bottom of the sea. Thank you, Professor Arena. <laughs> Now, fasten your helmets, gentlemen, for I'm about to close the waterproof door. We were in utter darkness. The rocket troll apparatus began operating the moment our helmets were fixed firmly in place. And I breathed with ease. Now I was about to step into a completely new element... This sinister unknown, led by a man for all I knew, was mad. A second door, located in the outer shell of the Nautilus sleepback, and in another moment, I was treading on the floor of the ocean. Dear friends, how can I describe the sight that met my eyes? A fantastic dream. No, no, more like more like an emotion. Yes, that's it. I moved through unbelievable beauty, no longer feeling the drag of my clothing and weighted shoes. The water acted like a prism from the early morning sun, so that we walked in a radiance of the seven solar colors. And I could see the silver sand shimmering away to a distance of 150 yards, dotted with star shell, flowers, rocks, shells, and pulpy of every shade and formation. Oh, what if my colleagues could see me now? They wouldn't believe it. I don't like this. Walking on the bottom of the sea. Escape. I'm going to escape from that underwater tub the first chance I get. We're approaching the old Spanish galleon. <laughs> I can see the surprise in Professor Arena's eyes as we enter the wreck. Even Ned Land is interested as he glimpses golden pieces of eight scattered on the deck. But here, my friends, look. As I open this gigantic chest... They look gold, plenty of it, sparkling, glinting in cold salt water. My eternal bank. I filled the small chest we brought along. So, sent it back to the Nautilus by one of my crew. And now, my dear professor, we'll go on to my pearl beds. <laughs> Captain, all these riches we saw today, you can only use so much. What good is the rest? Unless you help your fellow man. Professor Arena, you are my guest, an onlooker. I do not desire your advice. Oh, but it seems such a waste, sir, with so much need in the world. Enough! Yes, there is need among the oppressed races, the exploited, the ravaged. I am and ever shall be one with such unfortunates. Captain, look out there. A diver. He's looking in at us. Oh, yes. When you're sure. Yes, I know, but but but, but what, what what does he want? You asked a question, Professor. You shall have your answer. Even as I watched, a crew member in a diving suit appeared outside the window, gave the native diver the small treasure chest taken from the Spanish galleon, and the swimmer returned to the window. Humbly saluted Captain Nemo, who returned the gesture. And then the diver darted upward with his treasure. And I turned and looked at Nemo. What more do you want of me, Professor Arena? A confession written in heart's blood. That though I hate the world, I love my fellow man. Well, I, I couldn't answer him. 
If ever I saw tragedy burned across a man's face, I saw it in Nemo's. I could now understand his bitter philosophy, his moods broiling with hot and cold and like destroying, searing winds. Well then, a week later, Ned, Conceal and I saw another side of Nemo's nature. He had sighted a mysterious man of war. We surfaced. The ship fired at us. Oh, well, they're firing at us, sir. Let me hit that periscope. Stand back, Mr. Land. Ship of an accursed nation. You recognize me, don't you? Fear me. And now my vengeance. Torpedo one. No, Captain. They won't have a chance. Fire! Three. The man of war seemed to disintegrate. Captain Nemo watched it sink, an archangel of hatred. And then he turned and entered his quarters. I followed him as though hypnotized. I saw him uncover a picture on the far wall. A portrait of a young woman and two beautiful children. Before this group, Nemo spread his arms and then... Almighty God. Enough. Enough. After that catastrophic occurrence, the Nautilus moved in more and more of a dream world. I saw nothing of Captain Nemo or the crew, save the steward who served me. Everyone aboard seemed to be drugged in a state of complete apathy. And then, then Ned came to me with his plan. We're escaping tonight, Professor. Conceal and me have been working just towards such a time. We're off the coast of Norway. Escape? Well, are we in sight of land? Aye, sir. Just took the reckoning. There are hills 20 miles to the east of us. We'll take the small boat. I've stocked it with food and water. I've talked it over with Conceal. We'll meet at 10 tonight. Well, heaven knows I'm with you, Ned. Ever since seeing that ship go down, but the weather? How is it? Oh, the waves are bad, sir. Wind's blowing up a gale, but there's no problem. I feel safe once we're on the high seas, no matter what the weather. Well, very well. Lay your plans. I'll meet you at the appointed hour. As I waited, the events of my existence aboard the Nautilus passed before my mind's eye, and in my excitement, the growing tension. Captain Nemo seemed himself to grow immeasurably larger, no longer a man, but a creature of the waters, a genie of the sea, and then... Music. From the hands of a tormented soul longing to break its earthly bonds, such music as could only come from Captain Nemo himself... And then, my heart froze with terror. He was in the drawing room, the very room I must cross in order to make my escape. And the hour was striking for my rendezvous with destiny. So I made my way to the drawing room. The room was in a greenish half-light. Nemo sat before the pipe organ, playing as though music were his last avenue of expression and escape. And I held my breath as I passed in back of him. I reached for the far door. And Captain Nemo arose, and like a ghost, he walked straight towards me. Stop, Paranoid! I slammed the heavy door, and I ran to meet Ned. Professor! Professor. Yes, yes. Let us go. Aye, sir. We've uh, service to take on fresh air. They're we? coming after us. Quick. Upon deck, Professor. Come on. There we go. Good heavens, we're in a storm. Storm nothing. It's a maelstrom. Quick into the small boat. Those waves, look. They're closing in on us from every corner of the horizon. All right. Hold fast now. I'm going to take her off. <laughs> No, the waves, we are caught in the maelstrom. We are going down. You are safe, deep. Professor. Quite safe now. Uh, who? Conceal? The same, sir. And here's Ned, too. 
He brought us to the Maelstrom safely. Oh. We're in a fisherman's hut on the Lofoten Islands, Professor. Yes, but the Maelstrom, the Nautilus... Yeah, she was caught fair in the middle of it and went down, sir. And it's no better than she deserved, if you ask me. Well, if anyone could survive in such a storm, Captain Nemo could. At least, I hope so. You hope so, sir? Yes, Ned. After traveling 20,000 leagues under the sea with Nemo, I hope he lives on to conquer his hatred of the world. Forget vengeance in his love for the oppressed. As Ecclesiastes questioned 6,000 years ago, that which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? Huh? I hope that Captain Nemo can find his answer. Sullivan again with just a thought before we say good night. I suppose the subject closest to all our hearts just now is peace and how to find it. If we turn to God, talk to him, really pray with a faith that he'll hear our prayers, we will find an inner peace. And the man who is at peace with himself is at peace with his neighbor. Prayer and prayer alone can bring peace to the world. God is ready to give us much if we ask him. Is it so hard to ask? Is it too difficult to take a little time each day to be alone with God, to sit in silence and to pray to him? Gather all those minutes that you waste as a rule and utilize them for the wonderful purpose of prayer and see how your life changes, how much more happiness you find, how different your fellow man appears and acts. It's worth the trial, isn't it? So begin tonight and every night. Pray with your family and experience greater joy in one another and in your home and in God. Yes, the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. <laughs> From Hollywood, the Family Theater has brought you Otto Kruger in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea with High Aberback as Captain Nemo and with Maureen O'Sullivan as your hostess. Others in our cast were Jack Lloyd, Bill Conrad, Stephen Chase, and Leroy Leonard. This adaptation of Jules Verne's classic was written by Virginia M. Cook with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman and was directed for Family Theater by J.F. Mansfield. This series of family theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who have so unselfishly given of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to join us next week at this same time when Family Theater will present Wayne Morris, Lloyd Nolan, and Betty Lynn in Brannigan's Bat. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System.